Let's begin here in chapter 17. As I normally do, I will read a few verses to you, uh, give you, again, a little bit of a reminder for those who may not have been with us in our last study, just to set the tone, and then we'll move into our study. We're looking today at uh, verses 1 through 15 of chapter 17. I'll read verses 1 through 3, and we'll get into our study. Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 3. Luke writes, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ, is the Messiah. And so we've been following the Apostle Paul on what has been called his second missionary journey. He had been ministering into what is today modern Turkey. He had crossed the Aegean, and he had entered into a region at that time known as Macedonia, which is northern Greece. And we saw how that, when he was there in that area in Macedonia, he had planted the first church ever planted in Europe, the Church of Philippi. So, as he's ministering, Paul has encountered intense persecution, and he, in, he uh, encountered in severity in Philippi. Again, remember, there was a uh, demon-possessed young woman who was, uh, a demon was cast out of her, and as a result of that, uh, Paul was placed in jail. He had suffered a beating and a night in jail for doing something good. Now, in 1 Peter 2, verse 19, Peter said it like this. He said, it is a credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. And so persecution was something that he had become ready for. It was actually something that was becoming common. Now, Jesus had prepared the church while he was still walking on the face of the earth, and and he said you need to be prepared even to expect this kind of opposition, because there's a price that believers will pay when they actually really follow the Lord. Psalm 34, 19 says it like this, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him from them all. So Paul knew that he was going to suffer affliction as well as knowing that he was not abandoned. He knew that God was with him and God was fully aware of what he was enduring and he was enduring all of this for the sake of the kingdom. So after his night in jail, he and Silas had been released. They, they went to a woman by the name of Lydia's house, and, and there they encouraged the saints. And he made it very clear that through many tribulations, we enter into the kingdom of God. So after all of this has taken place, once again, he resumes his mission. And that's where we pick up our study here in verse 1. Now notice how it begins in chapter 17, verse 1. When they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And so Jesus had commanded the disciples to take the gospel in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, to the entire world. He had said, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So in obedience to the command, Paul is traveling from Philippi to a place called Thessalonica. Now, Amphipolis is around 30 miles south of Philippi, Apollonia 30 miles from Amphipolis, and Thessalonica is around 37 miles from Apollonia. So Apollonia was Prince's girlfriend. But anyway, I wanted to show you, (laughs) for you oldies. Okay, this is basically giving you an idea of what's going on. So you see up in the top there by Thrace, you see Philippi, and then you see uh, southeast Amphipolis and Apollonia. You see Thessalonica up there to the to the west, and, and then you'll see Berea. We'll be looking at all of those places. Today. Actually, we'll be seeing Thessalonica and Berea today. But that's been the way that Paul has been traveling. So he's from Philippi to Amphipolis to Apollonia, Thessalonica, and then we're going to close with Berea. So I wanted you to have that in your mind. So all of this is you know, giving to us a, an understanding of how long it took him to get to Thessalonica. So from where he was to where he ends up in Thessalonica, it was about a five-day journey. Now, Paul had spent a night in jail. He had been beaten with rods. He had been put in the stocks. He had been placed on a cold, wet floor in a prison. 
And he had every reason to complain to God about what was happening to him. This is unjust. This is wrong. I, I shouldn't be give, uh, going through these kinds of things. But instead of giving up, he and Silas actually gained strength through it. Instead of it causing him to close his mouth, he continued ministering. Proverbs 28 verse 1 says it like this. The wicked flee, though no one pursues. But the righteous are as bold as a lion. And that's what's happening in the ministry life of Paul. The more he endures, the stronger he becomes. He's gaining strength, and he's once again on the move, and he's on his way now to the city of Thessalonica. Later on, he's going he's to plant a church, and we'll see this in a moment. But later on, he's going to write to this church, and, and he's going to say in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 2, as you are aware, we had already endured suffering and shameful treatment in Philippi. But in the face of strong opposition, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God. So they're going to be aware of what has taken place and what has driven him basically to come and minister. So notice in verse 1, it says they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. So this, this city Thessalonica is called Salonica. Now I've been there in, in Greece, in northern Greece. This city was, uh, uh, was a, a large city. Uh, it had a commercial port and it attracted many foreigners. And amongst the foreigners who came to this place were a large group of Jews. That's why you have a synagogue that is mentioned. Now, it was a chief seaport in the region that we just looked at called Macedonia. It was what is called a harbor town. It had a population of 200,000. Now, that doesn't sound like much today in the way that we think, but that was a huge city in ancient days. It was a very large city. It was like their San Francisco or their New York, Los Angeles, Boston, or San Diego. It was a, a large, large city. But it was also filled with corruption and persecution. And it was very difficult for Paul to minister there. It had rigidly religious Jews who were completely against the message of the gospel. Now, as we're looking at this, laying another bit of the foundation, his ministry pattern has been developed. He often entered first into larger cities. Because he knows that the larger city has a, an influence that it wields on the smaller ones. If he could plant a work in a large city, very often smaller villages would follow suit. It, it's true to this day. Large cities influence um, various other places. So what takes place, we'll say, in Hollywood for the longest time is going to influence the whole nation. And so when something was planted in a large city, very often it had a progressive kind of effect on, on the villages and all that were around it. So he went into, into uh, this area and he, he's beginning to do a work and with the hope of reaching others. And so he makes his way, notice here, he makes his way, verse 17 to the, uh, verse 1, uh, verse 1 in chapter 17, he, he makes his way to the synagogue. He says, this calls it the synagogue of the Jews. And he would go there and he would minister to the Jews. And, and that's because he wanted them saved. And in Romans 1.16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then the Gentile. So he would take the message of the gospel to his uh, people and first and, and then minister to others. And so it says in verse 2, it was his custom to go in and to reason. He went into them for three Sabbaths, three consecutive Sabbaths. So again, Paul consistently would first enter a synagogue. It became his practice. In chapter 9, we saw it in verse 20. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. In chapter 13, verse 5, when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues. Chapter 14, verse 1, at Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. Now, he would do that for uh, many reasons, but one is because he had a commission to take the gospel out and to preach it. He wanted to reach all the people. It was a commission that Jesus Christ had given. Jesus said, you shall receive power. After that, the Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses of me in Judea, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Jerusalem and Judea, in, you would go to the Jew first and then to the Gentile was the pattern. And so he would go out and he would reach the Jews. 
As a matter of fact, in Romans 15, 20, he said, I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. I want to go out and preach the gospel, but to the Jew first and also the Gentile. You see, the entire world is spiritually lost. It's in spiritual bondage. And so it needs to be set free, and the gospel brings the word of God that brings freedom. In 1 John 5, 19, John said, we know that we're children of God. The whole world is under the control of the evil one. And so he's preaching the gospel to the whole world, and he's preaching to Israel. You see, as a, as a Jewish man, he had a special burden for Jewish people. In Romans 9, 2 through 4, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. So he had a general love for the world and a special love for the Jewish people, the people that he himself was part of. And so what does he do? Well, it tells us in, in verse 2 that he, he went there for three consecutive Sabbaths and he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. He reasoned with them. The word reason means to dialogue or discuss. It actually carries with it the meaning of arguing. So he would argue with them, he would reason with them, he discussed with them, dialogued with them, he was disputing with them. And how did he do it? Well, he, he did it through the Old Testament scriptures. What he's doing as he's there is he's showing them the Old Testament, how that it speaks to them concerning their Messiah. That's what he's doing. He's quoting Old Testament prophecies. He's showing how Jesus Christ fulfilled those prophecies. We know that Jesus fulfilled somewhere in the 300 plus range of prophecies. And so he's using scripture to demonstrate to them who Jesus Christ is. He quotes the scripture because the scripture reveals Christ. Remember in the gospel of Luke in chapter 24, remember the story of Jesus having a conversation with disciples who were on the road to Emmaus and he initiated a conversation with them and, and they told him that they were confused. They said that they had thought Messiah had come, but the Messiah, whom they thought was Messiah, had been killed. And, and then they went on to say certain women came to his tomb and they couldn't find his body. And so at that point, Jesus told them that he had fulfilled what the prophets had written. In Luke 24, 26 and 27, he said, Jesus said, Ought not the Christ who have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And that's what he's doing here. He is reasoning with them, Paul in verse 2, from the scriptures. He's speaking to them about Messiah. So he's giving them passages from the Old Testament. These are passages that reveal Jesus and what God has done in order to save people. Now, I want to make a simple point, and then I'll move on. Today, we very often want to reach people, and we use a variety of means, by all means necessary. Let's reach as many as we can, Paul would tell us. But what happens sometimes is we will, we will advance our music, and we'll advance personal testimonies, and we use those as... A, as a, a gospel presentation, and of course, uh, I'm not opposed to either one of those. I think, of course, that scriptural music and worship of Christ is very appealing, of course. And also, personal testimony goes a long way. God can use those things to reach people on a very personal level. When I first got saved, um, I began to learn scripture through the songs, not just through the reading and, and studying of Scripture and having Bible studies presented to me, that of course, but part of the way that I began to learn Scripture was through the songs. We called them Scripture songs, and we would sing, we would sing them in, in church services. Many of the young musicians who had gotten saved would pick up the Bible. They would find a verse, you know, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, and we would sing and clap and all of that. You know, great is the Lord, greatly to be praised. And, and we would sing these different songs that were scripture songs, and we knew uh, a, a lot of them. You know, we, we did that. We, we sang about the love of God, the way God saves, and scripture songs are powerful, and that's how I, I memorized a, a variety of scriptures. And not only that, 
But when we'd go to church, and very often the, the young pastor, like Lonnie Frisbee or somebody like him at Calvary Chapel, would, would speak concerning how God had transformed their life. And me as a hippie, I would listen to these people. I could relate. So there's nothing. I'm not speaking against the music, and I'm not speaking against the testimony. Those things are great. Those are great tools. God uses those things. Of course he does. But the thing that he uses to save people is not just the music and it's not just the testimony. And this is what we're seeing. The things that saves people, the thing that he uses to save is the scriptures. And that's what it says here. Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is a Christ. See, I could, I could sit down and I could say to a, a, a Buddhist, which at that time uh, I did, I could say this to somebody with a religious science or whatever. I could say, well, you know, I was a doper. I was a, I was a drunk. You know, I was this and that. And, and I came to faith in Christ. And, and they'd say, well, I was that too. But I found my truth in, in Buddha. So it wasn't enough that I was giving my testimony. There had to be something else that was stronger. It's the power of the word of God. And that's what he's doing. He's giving them passages from the scripture. Again, testimonies are great, but it doesn't bring people to salvation. In the end, salvation comes from God's word. In 1 Corinthians 1.21, Paul said it like this. He said, since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So it's the word of God that sets you free. It's the word of God that saves. It's the word of God that transforms. In John 6, 63, Jesus said, It's the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they're life. And so... 2 Samuel 2.29, you, O Lord, are my lamp. The Lord turns my darkness into light. You know, I had people say, you know, that you go to this particular Hindu guy and you'll be enlightened. That was a word. I, I think it's still used fairly commonly today. You know, you'll be enlightened and all of that. No, enlightenment doesn't come through some guru pressing me in the forehead and then a great light shot because that's what we were told that they press your forehead and a, and a burst of light will take place and you're going to be enlightened. No, enlightenment comes by the word of God and by the power of the spirit. That's how that comes. He enlightens my darkness. I once walked in darkness, Paul said the, to the Ephesians, but he has become to me the light of life. Jesus Christ has given us enlightenment by the power of the spirit. That's why when I got saved, I didn't go to some guru. I went to the word of God. And the word of God enlightens my darkness by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so that's what he's doing. He's sharing these things. And he's explaining God's word to them. Notice in verse 2 when it speaks of him reasoning. When it says he's reasoning, that includes fielding questions. So he's dialoguing. He's presenting to them the claims of Christ. It says in verse 3, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And so he's quoting various Old Testament passages, passages that we, the church, are familiar with. There are over, like I said, over 300 specific scriptures related to Christ in the Old Testament. So he would be speaking concerning uh, the fact that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, that he was from the tribe of Judah, that he's a descendant from King David. But he especially is speaking of how he fulfilled what was spoken of him in Isaiah as well as the Psalms. So verse 3, when it says that he's explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again, well, in Isaiah 53, a, a book that was written in the Old Testament over 700 years before Christ, it prophesies Messiah in Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 12, where Isaiah was inspired to write, he was despised, forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised. We did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, afflicted, 
but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, by his stripes, we are healed. So he would be quoting from the Old Testament. He'd speak from Isaiah. He'd speak from the Psalms, because it says he had to suffer and rise again. Psalm 16, verse 10, you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So he's pointing out who Christ is through Scripture. And that's what he says in verse 3, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Again in Acts 10, 43, all the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. He is the Christ. The Christ is a, a word that is a Greek word. Uh, in the Hebrew, it's Mashiach. He's the Messiah, the anointed one of God. So as he's pointing to, to Jesus as a suffering servant, he also is pointing to his death as well as his resurrection. Well, listen, verse 4 says, some of them were persuaded and a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. And so Gentiles and women were open to the message, and it says here that they were persuaded. Now, the word persuaded means to be convinced. It means to be convinced by somebody's words that they might believe. They were persuaded. They're convinced by what was said that they might believe. That has led to what we today in, in the church community refer to the ministry of apologetics. The apologist is the one who presents the scriptures. I remember my mom saying to me, she, she used to call me daddy. She said, daddy, why do they call uh, Christians apologists? We don't apologize for anything. That was my mom. We don't apologize for believing in Jesus. My mom was real radical. And I said, no, mama, we don't. But the word apologist or apologetics is speaking of explaining the reason behind our faith. And that's what an apologist does. That's a ministry of apologetics, is to explain what we believe. That's what he was doing. He was pointing to Christ as the suffering servant, that he died, and that he was resurrected, and he was persuading, and people were listening. Now, earlier we had seen the birth of the church of Philippi, and now we're seeing the birth of the church in Thessalonica. Notice how it says that the majority of the new believers were Gentiles, Later on, Paul would write them in his first letter, and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, he would say to them that they had turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So these were people who were devout Greeks who became what are called God-fearers. It included, he says, many prominent women. They were attracted to the purity of the faith of Israel. But not everybody is going to believe. Verse 5, the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. That word attacked means literally to raid. They raided his house. Now they did not allow themselves to be persuaded. I want you to notice in this in verse 5. Let me explain something briefly. Notice again in verse 5 it says the Jews who were not persuaded that speaks of not allowing themselves to be persuaded. It is what has been called a willful rejection. It's something that has been fueled by a spiteful envy. They would not allow themselves to believe. Now, we had seen this in what is called Pisidian Antioch when the Jews had rejected the gospel. It says in Acts 13, 45, when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming, opposed the things spoken by Paul. In verse 50 of Acts 13, the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. Now, that's happened before. The religious Jews rejecting the gospel was, it was such, such persecution and rejection that they just pushed them out. So these are people who are hardening their hearts. They're not listening to what is being said. I've spoken to people who, are, who have told me they are, who have literally said it. I, I remember on one occasion I was speaking to one, one, one fellow, and, 
His name was Rich, and as I was speaking to him, I, I shared some things with him about Jesus, and, and he said to me, uh, he goes, well, he says, I have no reason to disagree with you, he says, but I can't follow, I can't follow Jesus the way you're telling me to and I, or calling me to, and I said, well, why is that? He says, because, he says, I can't come to faith in Christ in the way you're presenting him because that my mother will be upset if I become a Christian and step away from the faith that she raised me in. He said, and for me to, to change my, what he thought was his religion, for me to change that is, is saying that my mother lied to me. He said, I can't do that. I've had that happen twice. I had somebody else say to me one time, the same thing. Basically, the same thing. I was sharing the gospel with him, and, and he said to me, uh, he said, you know, he says, yeah. I, I, I go, okay, you can, you can think I'm, I'm an idiot. And he says, I don't think you're an idiot. I respect you. He says, and that's, he says I, I just can't because I've been raised by my mom to believe this, and I won't turn my back on my mom. And I said to him, are you willing to go to hell for your mother? And he said, Yes. And I said, I wasn't, but I was willing to bring my mom to heaven. I said, you need to know Jesus so you can bring her to heaven with you. But there are people who know, but they willfully reject. They hear, but they, on, they're hardening their hearts. Like it says in Ezekiel 3, verse 7, the house of Israel will not listen to you because they will not listen to me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Ezekiel was a prophet, and God is saying, they're not going to listen to you because they don't listen to me. Hebrews 4 verse 2 says, Indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So they may hear, but they don't put their faith in. These were not persuaded. They rejected willfully. They rejected what was being said. They had nothing to do with it, wanted nothing to do with it. As a matter of fact, they firmly opposed it. Look at verse 5. The Jews who were not persuaded became envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, gathered a mob, set all the city in an uproar, attacked the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. So they gathered these wicked men who were hanging around the marketplace, and uh, these are the kinds of guys that would be easily encouraged to create uh, trouble. It says in verse 5 that they raided the the house, they attacked the house of Jason, and they wanted to bring them out to the people. It seems that Jason was a believer who was hosting Paul and the team. But, verse 6, when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Now, that's something similar that was brought against them when they were in the city of Philippi. In Acts 16, 20 and 21, these men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or observe. And so they're making a similar charge, but notice how they say it in verse 6, they have turned the world upside down. That shows you the, the power and the impact of the church in the early days for them to say the world is being turned upside down. Would to God that the church would once again have the charge of turning the world upside down. It seems sometimes that the world has has infiltrated to the church so much that the church is doing very little to influence the world. And yet, in the early days, they said, these people are turning the world upside down. But as believers, we say, no, we're not turning the world upside down. We're turning the world right side up. And the way we're doing that is by the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And so they're saying these people are troublemakers and they're causing problems for us here. And the idea that we Christians are troublemakers uh, hasn't stopped. It continues to this day. Uh, uh, The the right to life, even as we're celebrating the reality of that uh, today here in our fellowship, aware of and celebrating the reality of that, we're still looked at as troublemakers. We're still being presented as those who don't care and, and things like that and and uh, the argument is still going on because we do care, because we care about the babies, we care about the women, we care about the, the young men involved. There's lives that are being destroyed that the church ought to care for. And that's what we're doing. But they're saying, no, you guys are just a bunch of troublemakers. Well, verse 7 says that Jason has harbored them. 
And, and these are acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there's another king, Jesus. And so these are not charges that can be ignored. They're, they're, they're charging them with disturbing the peace of preaching an illegal religion and advocating sedition by proclaiming a different king. Jesus Christ is a king. Pontius Pilate had asked him, are you a king? And Jesus responded, it's as you say, but I'm not a king after this world. If I had a kingdom that was modeled after this world, my servants would be at war. But my kingdom is a kingdom of the heart. That's what Jesus taught. And so they're saying they're advocating a different king. And we as believers would say, absolutely, our king is Jesus Christ. We, we bow our knee to him. We follow his commands. We're part of his kingdom. Yes, of course. Well, they got them upset. And it says they troubled the crowd. And the rulers of the city, when they heard these things, these were charges that they couldn't ignore. So, verse 9, so when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So they forced Jason to post bond. Like today, it would have been forfeited if, if violated. And, and so what happens is by doing this, they're guaranteeing that Paul and Silas will not create any more trouble. And so after they post the bond, verse 10, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. And so to allow the bond to be refunded for their safety, Paul and Silas leave. We just saw the map. Berea is around 50 miles southwest of Thessalonica. And again, notice when they arrive, they go into the synagogue. Once again, they go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel to preach to them. And this is in spite of how they had recently been treated. Just because some are not interested in Christ doesn't mean that we should give up. There are a lot of people who are. But it seems sometimes that nobody is. But there are a lot of people who are saying, and I'm hearing this now, um, just tell us the truth. Can't you just tell us the truth? Everybody is so careful not to speak what is true because they're afraid of being called judgmental or harsh that they keep their mouths quiet. No, we need to learn to speak the truth in love. But if we don't speak the truth, how are people going to know that they're blind and walking in darkness? And the world sets up systems to keep them in darkness. They're already dark. They're already in the darkness as is because spiritually they are darkened. But they're hiding, if you will, and thinking that the way that they're living isn't going to be noticed. I have a three-year-old granddaughter, my Elena, and she will cuddle up next to me on the couch, and she'll bury her head in my shoulder, and she will, she's hiding from grandma. She's three years old. She's hiding from grandma, and so what I'll do is I'll put my hands over her eyes and I'll say, she can't see you. And she'll sit there and she'll yell, Grandma! But my hands are blocking the view. And she actually, at this point, one day she'll realize her grandfather's a liar, but <laughs> right now it's just fun. She'll say, Grandma! And I'll say, she can't see you. She can't see you. Because something is blocking the view. You know, that's how we are before we're saved, is we think that if we hide behind good works or hide behind something, whatever, religion, if we hide behind something, God won't see the evil that we actually do. We have this idea that we can hide from God. And what we are actually is we're hiding from truth. And so they don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear it because it's convicting because it makes them realize what they need. And so Paul hasn't given up. Sometimes it seems that people don't care. But every time an invitation is given in this fellowship, there are people who respond to it because they need Jesus Christ. And they know it. You may be one of those even today. You need Jesus Christ. You're living in darkness, hiding from God. But God sees all that you're doing and he's welcoming you to himself if you turn from your wicked ways and come to him. And so this is what's taking place here. They arrive, they go to the synagogue, they go to the lost sheep. 
But notice how he's there in the synagogue. He receives a different reception. Verse 11 says they were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out (laughs) whether these things were so. They are more fair-minded. When it says they were more fair-minded, that means they were, the the word is of noble mind. They were, they had a a nobility in the way that they were listening. They were listening with a heart that was willing to hear and to test. They were not predisposed, in other words, to reject what was being said. These were people who were aware of their own lacking. And they wanted to hear the claims of Messiah. Now, Paul is preaching to them in a simple way. And when he did that, by the way, he wasn't trying to impress them with the way that he spoke. He he said to the the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1, So it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I didn't come with eloquence or, or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. He went on into verse 4 of the same chapter, verses 4 and 5, to say, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. And that's what Paul's doing. He's, He's bringing the Word of God in a simple fashion. He's explaining to them. He's not trying to use eloquence. He's not trying to deceive them in a crafty way. He's speaking clearly. He's not making untrue statements and claims. He's not trying to impress them with his ability to communicate or his vast knowledge of Scripture. He's simply preaching simply. He's saying this is who Jesus Christ is. You see, the gospel doesn't need to be dressed up to entertain people. The ones who need the gospel to be entertaining are normally the ones who drift away. But Paul preached salvation to a fair-minded people, and their desire was to know God. Now, that reminds me of a devout man we find in Scripture. His name was Simeon. He's referred to in the Gospel of Luke. This is a man who longed to see Messiah, and the Spirit had received him that he wouldn't die until he had, had been able to do so. And Joseph and and Mary had brought Jesus to be presented in the temple, and uh, Simeon was there. And when Simeon saw them in Luke 2, 29 through 32, this is what he said. He said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you've prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. These people wanted to know God. That helps us to understand what our purpose and what our reason for attending Bible studies are. Why do we go? Why do we attend certain places or do certain things? Why? We need to always be very quick to look at our own hearts, to ask ourselves that reason. Why do we go? A long time ago when I first began to teach, I made a a decision that I would do the very best I, as a pastor teacher, could do to actually teach the Word of God. It's, It's not hard to tell stories. As a matter of fact, that's the way that I learned. My mom would tell me stories all the time. That's how I learned. My mom was a storyteller. And so she would tell me stories about this and that. She told me, I'll I'll give you one example. I could tell you many. But my mama, for example, said to me, you know, David, do you ever pray and not get your prayers answered? Well, I'm six, seven years old. I don't even know what that means, really. But I'd say, yes, mama, I do. And she said, well, let me tell you a story. That's how mama would do it. She said, let me tell you a story. She said, there was a little girl, this is one of my mom's stories, there was a little girl who, when she was little, would pray and ask God to give her red wings. She wanted red wings. And then one day, because she didn't get the red wings, she told her mom, I don't believe in God anymore, and I'm not going to pray to him anymore. I asked for red wings, and he didn't give me red wings. And she said, you know what happened? And right now, you know, I like stories. I said, well, what happened, mama? Well... She was a young teenager going to her first prom, and she had a a backless dress. And as her mama helped her to get ready for the prom, her mama said to her, baby, aren't you glad now that you didn't get those red wings? So my mom would tell me stories like that about why God can, and she didn't even know the Lord yet. 
But she had kind of like these people. She was fair-minded. She wanted to know God. My dad wouldn't allow a Bible in the house when I grew up because the only people he knew who read the Bible, he said, were crazy. <laughs> and so Mama, that's the only thing I know for certain that she ever disobeyed my dad in it. She hid a Bible. And she would read her Bible. And my mom wanted to know God. So when I got saved, forgive me. I don't know why I get emotional. But when I got saved, Mama had been reading in her Bible, misunderstanding it, by the way, in the book of Isaiah, a little child shall lead them. She read that. She said, what's that mean? So when I came in and told her about Jesus, she said, well, I had read a little child. Well, Mom, that was incorrect. But you got saved because she was, I want to know God. I want to know. See, so for me, I, I don't like to waste my time. I just don't. I don't have enough of it left in my life to be wasting now. I don't like to waste my time. So if I go to a Bible study, I want to know what the Bible says. I don't want to hear the stories that the evangelist can give me. I don't want to hear how great that person may be. I want to know how great Jesus is because that helps me to live. You see? And that's what's taking place. And so it says in verse 11, they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures. The word received means to welcome, to accept. The word readiness means to be willing or eager. And the word search means to thoroughly investigate. These Bereans are models of faith and reason. They're ready to believe, but they're examining what is being said. They're not going to simply trust everything he says. They're going to trust uh, what the scripture says. They're not going to trust everything he's saying or what they're feeling. They want to know what God's word says. So they made a determination to examine the word itself. They weren't naive, but they weren't cynical either. They wanted to know God. Again, that's a model to every believer in Jesus Christ. We are not to naively believe everything we hear. We hear and we search. In 1 John 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. Later, Paul would write the Thessalonians and it would seem to infer something of the Bereans, using them as an example, because in 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 and 21, he said, Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. And so they heard what was being said. They searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, verse 12, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. So God used this to reach them. But, verse 13, when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also, stirred up the crowds. Immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea. But both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. And so notice how the Jews, the unbelieving Jews from Thessalonica came to do what they could to interrupt him preaching. The world is diligent to ensure that the gospel is not preached. Uh, Football quarterback, a believer in Christ, recently won a game and gave testimony of how good Jesus is. This happened just within the last week or two. And he, he was giving testimony of Christ. But the, the station broadcasting his interview after the game cut off his testimony. Because they do that. If he were a Muslim, it wouldn't have been cut off. But he was a Christian. And we don't want to hear Jesus being honored. It's going to offend people. Well, that's what happens. The world is diligent to ensure that the gospel is not preached. And driven by envy, the enemies of the gospel pursue Paul that they might make more problems. And they were willing to take a good journey to interrupt his ministry. Notice in verse 13 how they stirred up the crowds. The word stirred up speaks like a storm on the sea. They're disrupting it. And the men that they, that they got, these evil men, uh, were enemies. They're enemies of the law is what it is. And so it's making it dangerous for Paul to remain, and so they send him away. Verse 14 says, the brethren sent Paul away, but Silas and Timothy remained. 
So in verse 15, to protect Paul from further danger, they sent him to, to Athens. And from there, he's sending for Silas and Timothy that they might join him immediately. Why would that be? Well, Paul was concerned for the new believers in Thessalonica and Berea. He wants to know what has happened to them since he has left. He knew that they were going to go through things. And as a father in the faith, he wanted, he wanted to hear how they're doing. And it always bothers, it always will bother a person who brings somebody else to the Lord to hear that they've gone through pain. I remember a young man in one of the Bible studies here in the fellowship in our earlier days who had, he was a, a real rough guy. He was a, a, a real tough guy. And he gotten saved. And he and I got to know each other. He'd come and talk to me and all, and I got to know him a little bit. And one day he had come to a midweek Bible study, and, and as he was there, I saw him. He walked up, and his, he had a black eye. His, his, his eye was swollen shut. And I looked at him, and I said, what happened to you? He says, oh, he says, I work at, and he told me some, some store, he says, and he says, some guy walks in, and he put some alcohol down on the counter. Now, I've been telling people, you know, share your faith, tell people about Jesus. So he says, so he put the alcohol on the counter. He says, all I said to him was, you really don't need that. So he hit me. He said, and I'll, I'll tell you the rest of the story. This is what he told me. He said, so he hit me, and he says, so I jumped over the counter and grabbed him, <laughs> and I put him down, and I pulled my hand back. He said, but I remember it. I'm not supposed to be violent. He says, because you've been teaching me the word that I'm supposed to be loving and forgiving, so I let him go. When he walked in with his black eye, I felt bad. I, I did. Because what I encouraged him to, he paid a price for. But that's what happens. When you're encouraged to do the right thing, there will be prices you pay. And a lot of people are not willing to pay the price. Not that we should go out and, and start, you know, what are you doing there? What are you doing there? What are you doing there? Pow, pow, pow. We don't need that. <laughs> what we need to do is be aware of what's taking place. And Paul knew. Something was happening. As a matter of fact, he writes in 1 Thessalonians 2.14 and says, For you brothers and sisters became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews. He heard news. What happened? Persecution. Persecution erupted. As a pastor as well as an apostle, Paul loved the people there. He knew that those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But that doesn't mean he didn't want to hear how they're doing. How are they doing? They're new believers in Thessalonica. These new believers in Berea, it's a, it's a pressure cooker. There's going to be violence. So I want you guys to come as fast as you can. I want you to tell me what's happening and so it says, receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. And as they depart, we'll be picking this up next time. Paul is in the great pagan city of Athens. And we're going to be seeing what happens. What is the thing that provokes a person to preach? We're going to be seeing that next time we get together.